basically, I see a market for the old vintage style amps again, and people don't want to go back to them. If they, if they wasn't a market, they wouldn't buy the old black face fenders. It wouldn't be worth a lot of money. I wouldn't be restoring them. Yeah, some are collectors, but most of them want to play them. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for that warm, original, vintage sound. My dad taught electronics in the 20s and 30s during the Depression. He built radios, and they sold them out of a confectionery store that he had. So by the time I was 13 years old, I was repairing televisions. And I knew how to use an oscilloscope and all the meters and so on. I had the best teacher in the world. Mainly my knowledge was on repairing, engineering, designing, because I put several radios together and so on. But that's how I got the contact to Fender. And I was a little nervous because I wanted the job. They told me what it would be. And I thought, oh boy, engineering and some quality control stuff. I didn't know who would interview me or anything, but it was Leo Fender. I went to work for Fender and I worked in that department and did some light engineering until sometime in 63, I don't know exactly when. And about that time they came in and said, okay, we want you to go to work in the lab. You're the one guy that knows the tube amp thing. We're bringing in new people. We want to make solid state, new technology items. And so I went to work as an engineer then, project engineer in the Fender lab. And I put right away on the solid state amplifier equipment. Guitar players, if they played country, which was still being played, not country rock, but straight country, they liked them. But if they were playing country rock, jazz, blues, or rock and roll, you could turn the thing to nine and it wouldn't distort. It was very clean. And they were saying, well, whatever Fender designs, we can sell because they're the name. They'll get it out there. People will like it. We'll make gadgets to go with it. And I went, well, whatever, but this is my opinion. And then it reached the point where they started cutting corners on the CBS. Not old Fender, not Leo. This was the CBS people. They started cutting corners on the board they were going to use in it on the components that we're gonna use in it, and trying to save money here and there. And I didn't really wanna leave at the time. That was one of the best things that ever happened to me, but I didn't wanna leave. So I did leave and I went to work at Rickenbacker and that story is pretty complete. I was given whatever time I needed to develop a new, completely different style, tube sounding amp, but with new technology. So I was able to make a solid state amp and pretend like it was a tube amp, just sub devices in there. Everything at Fender was basically direct coupled. You wanted the most pure sound you could get, that's hi-fi. That's great for keyboard, wonderful for PA, not the sound of an amp for a guitar or even a bass necessarily. So at Rickenbacker, they didn't want me to make a tube amp, we had several but he wanted it to sound like a tube amp. And I said, okay, the only way to do that is use individual transistors and capacitively couple them and throw in coils to kick in some of the overtones. And we can do a pretty good job of making a nice sounding amp that'll fall in the tube amp warm overtone category. And he let me put on the little rocker switches and, and the great reverb, it had a great reverb, it had a really great tremolo. So it started selling, and I know they didn't give stuff away, it started selling to top groups. And people know, you know, Led Zeppelin used them, and uh, Jeff Beck used them, the Strawberry Alarm Clock, which was well known back then. My time at Rickenbacker was great, and I learned a lot. And I have nothing but gratefulness for Fender and Francis Hall at Rickenbacker, because they gave me opportunities to do things that were great but nobody could afford their amps. It was like Fender made a product that I thought should have been made different, and Rick and Maker were making a product that I thought had a good sound, and we were gonna maybe develop some other things there too. I designed stuff that never went out because Francis wanted you to keep designing, but he didn't always put it in production. So I finally reached a point where, I, I think it was around 1969, 70, I said, I love working for you, but I want to see my products in the multitude's hands. It's nice for pros to have them, but I want to make some amps that will get down into the, you know, category of somebody's basement that's practicing in their garage and like, like Fender was doing with the smaller amps. And so he parted ways in a very friendly way because he had everything he needed designed anyway for the next year or two. And so 
I left and temporarily took a job in electronics as a sales engineer while my patent rights were covered because I agreed with him not to design anything for a year and not to use any of the stuff I designed for him to start new. And so I kind of took that time to think about things and then I started Rissen with the idea of making a really good solid state amp and also a tube amp. I wanted both lines because there's a there's a you know there's a space a place for both of them. And, and there's certain things solid state amps will always do better than tube amps. And then there's certain things if you're an old guy like me and you think of vintage, there's certain things tube amps do that no matter what, and I did a lot of solid state designing and made them very tubey sounding, but they never get the attack, they never get exactly the same overtones, they just aren't the same thing. They took me back to this little space in the back where all this electronic equipment was and here's Leo Fender and Freddy Tavares and this is the little area that they did all the design work in and Leo started to interview me. The input was from the musicians and Leo Fender took that information and I learned that from him. You listen to what musicians want and then you work on the circuits and you select the speakers. Um, you also listen to them what they say when it has to do with reliability or what it has to do with portability. And if you look at it, the ones we're building right now and until we run out of parts are using vintage Ajax capacitors, the same kind that were used in the fenders. And these parts that are in here are actually American made parts that are brand new that I've had in storage all these years. This is the Marvel. Uh, we kept simplicity as our main goal and the sound design is for a vintage kind of an app that you would have bought in the 60s. You can set it and you will hear that the overtone or the voicing of the sound varies. So you can get a, a lot of variety of, of sounds. And artists from one end of the spectrum to the other, where they play jazz, country, blues, or rock, really like the tone on this, but they all set it up different. Mm -hmm. 